deadly shootout claims two lives and threatens countless innocent bystanders. <laughs> Birthday party. It was going to be a great night. All on the floor, blatant like crazy. With a trio of witnesses hanging on for dear life, Lieutenant Joe Kenda must determine if this is a case of cold-blooded revenge. It's not the only time in history that some witness has been eliminated. Or a deadly rival that dates back decades. Outlaw biker groups were trying to expand their territory. As the mystery deepens, it's up to Kenda to stop the shooter before it's too late. He had a bulletproof vest, full of ammo. He has an arsenal fit for a warlord. Gang mentality has been with us for thousands of years, and it makes it incredible dangerous because it dehumanizes the victim. It speaks to the worst side of human nature, the violent side. There's one thing that never changes, murder. A life has been taken. Their stories are now my stories. I never know where a case is going to lead, but I'll never stop until it's solved. Somebody has to look out for the victim. If you kill, I will find you. Saturdays are normally busy for the Colorado Springs PD, but tonight is one for the record books. Dispatch to car 31. 31, go ahead. There's been a shooting at Jim and I's bar. 10 four in route. Be advised, it's a possible shootout with an outlaw. Club. 10-4. It's the shooting in progress. We've got three other cars in route. Good luck and stay safe. Jim Nice Bar is very popular with bikers and biker games. <laughs> We've got six more that have been taken to the hospital. 
including one that uh, Officer Rao had to take down. Jesus. Anybody guys get hit? No, thankfully, no. That's where we got so far. The shooting begins inside the bar. Then it moves outside, and then it moves to a restaurant parking lot immediately north of that building, where the shooting continues until the police arrive and stop it. Walking across the parking lot, Kenda observes a crime scene that looks more like a war zone. I see an enormous number of rifle casings, and I recognize them immediately as 762 by 39 millimeter. This is fired out of a Kalashnikov, more commonly known as an AK-47. We've at least got one. On the Gemini's front door lies 33-year-old Stephen Fairfax. Was he a member of the Sons of Silence? The guy that I did him said that he wanted to be. You don't automatically just become a member of the Sons of Silence. Somebody has to vouch for you. If they take a vote that they will accept you as a spec, a prospective member. He's a spec for the SOS. Kenda starts by examining Stephen's injuries. He's been shot three times, once in the neck, once in the arm, and once in the torso. Looking at the neck, I would say his spinal cord is severed, and he's dead before he hits the ground. Instantaneous. Kenda turns his attention to the evidence surrounding the body. 380. My first thought is the expanded casings are probably from the 9mm handgun laying in the parking lot some distance away. But then we can look at these casings and they're 380s. They come out of a 380 handgun, not a 9mm. To Kenda, the 9mm casing suggests Stephen Fairfax fired a weapon multiple times during the shootout. But they also beg another question. Now, where's the gun? Kenda moves inside, where the shootout seemingly began. It's an older bar. There's signs that there was live music being played at the time. A microphone, drum set, things like that. There are streamers around indicating it's a birthday party. There was a lot of damage in there. Chairs knocked over, stools knocked over, bullet holes, people, blood. It's clear that somebody had actually just fired a weapon multiple times into the ceiling. Now, are they doing that to get everybody's attention? That would certainly do it. Have you guys been collecting up all the casings here? What's the caliber? A lot of 7.62 by 39 and a few 9 millimeters. So with the 380 rounds that we have outside, and now we have 9 millimeter and AK-47 rounds inside, we know that there are at least three weapons involved in this incident. Who did what to whom, and who started this, and who tried to finish it? Kenda heads out to the Gemini's patio, where patrons who didn't flee when police arrived are now gathered. Before we have witnesses, not a lot to choose from. Everyone's claiming they were here just having a good time. But all of a sudden it goes from party to gunfire, with no clear explanation of how it did that. So you're the bartender? Yeah, Susan Sotomayor. I'm Lieutenant Kenda. Just tell me what you saw tonight. She begins her statement by saying that there was a birthday party that was underway for a very popular biker and hadn't gotten underway yet. Everybody's in a good mood. She is pouring, everybody drinks. All of a sudden, she sees one individual with an AK-47. Terrified, Susan got out of the bar and stayed put until the shooting stopped. <laughs>
very protective of Jim and I in the bar. Knowing PK is a full-fledged member of the Sons of Silence, and that Stephen Fairfax is a spec, Kenda wonders if the gang itself had been targeted. What's the year these outlaw biker gangs gather in the area of Aspen, Colorado, for a supposed friendly rally? They have a tendency to hate each other, and they gather for a council every year to air out their differences, kind of like biker court. And despite their promise of no trouble, there always is trouble. This year's Aspen rally had occurred just a few weeks before tonight's bloodbath. It really piques our interest in whether or not this is related to something that possibly happened up in Aspen. Are we going to be up to our wasted dead bikers? We need to find out if this is the opening salvo of a biker war. We're investigating a mass shooting at Gemini's Bar. Given the fact that the Sons of Silence are frequent customers of this establishment, is this a biker war? What is going on here? Aware that there was a gathering of outlaw biker gangs in nearby Aspen prior to the shooting, Kenda reaches out to the Narcotics Division to see if they have any additional intel. Yeah, certainly could be. Sons have been getting a lot of flack, mostly from Hell's Angels. They tell us the Hells Angels have been moving into Colorado and encroaching on their turf. The Angels consider themselves to be the first and the best of the outlaw gang. The Hells Angels have a history going back to the 1940s. They came from World War II, returning veterans, Bakersfield, California, who missed the action, the brotherhood, loyalty. They started riding motorcycles, which nobody did then and formed in groups. They were fiercely patriotic. They only rode American motorcycles. But over time, some branches of the Hells Angels turned outlaw, seduced by the easy money of the drug trade. And just like any enterprise, they're trying to expand their territory for their own personal gain. So they ain't just got their eye on Colorado now. Looks like it. More territory, more drugs. I can imagine the Suns aren't too happy about that. The Suns are one of the smaller biker gangs, but it is widely known that they control Colorado. How dare the Hells Angels think otherwise? Do you think it's going to be an all-out war? I sure hope not. Fortunately for Kenda, there's a simple way to find out. The local chapter of the Angels is not in the Springs, it's in Denver. So we drive to Denver. in the door and all of a sudden you heard crickets. Can we help you? I'm sorry to interrupt. There was some trouble at a bar in the Springs last night. A uh, place where the Sons of Silence hang out sometimes. You guys know anything about that? We heard about it. We didn't have anything to do with that. Can't say I'm sad it happened though. I think maybe they're telling the truth. They tend to be kind of proud of what they do. If they were the people, they would tell you without telling you. If it wasn't you, you know who she talked to? Yeah, I can't help you. Well, if you hear anything, make sure you give us a call. This shooting doesn't appear to be related to turf wars going on. So it's the usual. Back to the beginning. Let's start again. Who got shot? Could it be somebody with a motive against Mr. Fairfax only? And not against the Sons of Silence. So we have to, we were able to identify Stephen's stepmom, Loretta Collins. Yes? No, I'm Lieutenant Kevin, I can ask you a few questions. You here to talk about Stephen? Loretta tells us that he graduated high school. He went to the University of North Colorado for a short period of time. And he returned to Colorado Springs, where he started to pursue more his interest into being a member of the motorcycle organization. He always had a wild streak in him. 
he was having difficulty holding his life together. But the one thing he absolutely loved was his motorcycle. Can you think of anyone that want to harm him? You know, we hung around with a rough crowd, but he was a good person. Well, thank you for your help. Still unable to catch a solid lead, Kenda turns to the database for information on Mr. Fairfax. Hey, Jill, you're not going to believe this. What's up? We learned that he had an interaction with the Sheriff's Department in Boulder County six days before his death. That is something that really piques our interest. That was a homicide, and our only eyewitness, Stephen Fairfax. Omar Kett Spencer had been arrested for killing her estranged husband. Just because she's in custody doesn't rule her out for being responsible. No, it does not. Did Marquette Spencer order a hit on Stephen Fairfax from the cozy confines of Boulder County Jail? And had the attack on Fairfax triggered the massive shootout at the Gemini Bar? Fairfax is a witness in a homicide, and now he is dead for multiple gunshot wounds. That seems rather convenient. people in a hospital and are going to emergency surgery and now we're in possession of information that says Mr. Fairfax the deceased is an eyewitness in a recent homicide in Boulder County the woman charged with the Boulder County homicide is one Marquette Spencer Kenda wonders if Marquette had Stephen Fairfax killed in order to silence him we don't know how critical his testimony will be to that prosecution but we know that it's not the only time in history that some witness has been eliminated Office. Janice. Hi, this is Joe Kenda from uh, Colorado Springs. Hey, Joe. How's it going down the springs? You need some help from Boulder? Yeah, I do, actually. I have some questions about a homicide involving a Marquette Spencer. Can you tell me what went down? Yeah. They report that Fairfax is hanging out with Marquette when her ex-husband stops by and a bickering match ensues. Go ahead. How's your free I'm sick of giving you this Giving me this Yeah, you ain't selling nothing. Look, you can get out now. You can get out of my own house. It's not your house anymore. Whoa, 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 Mr. Fairfax ran into another room to call 911. Hey, I, I need help. It's 16 Kane Avenue. Oh, my God. He heard gunshots. He came back outside to notice that Margaret Spencer is holding the gun and Andrew White is on the ground, dying. We've got her charged with second-degree murder. Her trial is in just a few months. Interesting timing. Kenda dispatches one of his detectives to the Boulder County Jail to determine if Marquette Spencer is the mastermind of the attack on Stephen Fairfax. My name's Detective Kingsbury. I need to ask you a few questions. Sorry to inform you, ma'am, that uh, Mr. Fairfax is dead. Stephen's dead? What happened? She is shocked to learn that Stephen Fairfax, her friend, is dead. She's even more shocked to learn that we would think she would somehow do something to harm him. You think I had something to do with it? Well, I wouldn't be here if we didn't. Look, what I did was terrible, but it was an accident. You know, I was out of my mind, I was hot. My ex came over, and things got out of control. So you're not denying killing Andrew White? No. Now, this is not the personality who wants to eliminate a witness. She's willing to tell a detective from another jurisdiction she's responsible for this crime. Okay. I appreciate your time and help. Hoping to learn more about what happened at the Gemini, Kenda decides to question the survivors of the shootout. So we walk into this hospital to check on conditions on everyone that's been shot. Excuse me. How can I help you? Hey, I'm Lieutenant Kenda. I want to check on the people involved in the shooting last night. Um, I'm so sorry, Lieutenant, but uh, Paul Klein has passed away from his injuries. 40-year-old Paul Klein, known to his fellow Sons of Silence gang members as PK, had been friends with the owners of the Jim and I for years and even worked there as a manager. He was entrusted to make decisions on our behalf when we weren't there. He was a good dude. There was no two ways about it. He was friendly with everybody. He was also a very educated man. Everything that he meant to say, he said it. 
very eloquently. What are the odds that the others will pull through? We have two individuals that have some very serious injuries, Eugene Bayless and Alan Daniels. There's also three others who have less serious injuries. Our desire is really to interview all victims in this case. Until Kenda can question the survivors, he remains in the dark about what or who instigated... Sorry, Lieutenant, but the patients are still heavily sedated from the surgery. Don't think it's not a good idea today. Okay, I'll try back later. Thanks for your help. While he waits on the survivors to be cleared for questioning, Kenda asks detectives to dig into their backgrounds, starting with a man Officer Rao shot, 42-year-old Eugene Bayless. He didn't put down the gun, which led to him being shot, so why did he not comply with the officer's orders? Kenda assumes Eugene is also a member of the Sons of Silence. Come in. But a background check makes Kenda think twice. There's nothing, not even a parking ticket. What? Apparently, he's their choir boy. It would be very unusual for one of the members not to have some kind of criminal record. He's nobody. So why, in God's name, is he in this establishment with all this ammunition and AK-47? Who is Eugene? We've got an address here. Let's head over there. Kenda and his men head out to the address on file for Eugene Bayless. That's his parents' home. They live in a rural part of the city, just east of the city limits. On a very small ranch, a few acres of ground. Can I help you? Miss Bayless? Yes. Sorry to have to tell you, but your son was involved in a shooting downtown. Oh my God. I said, well, Eugene is injured. He's going to survive. Don't be alarmed. But then we have to advise her that he was actually one of the shooters. Eugene's a good son. He's a Vietnam vet. But I know things have been harder these past few years. His wife divorced him, took the kids. Do you know if your son owns any weapons? Well, yeah, he does. He's got quite a collection in his room. Would you mind if we take a look at his room? He lives in the root cellar. Excuse me? It's around back. He actually likes to call it a bomb shelter. Please. Eugene lives in a bunker, which is 9 by 12 feet. Excuse me. This is where Eugene resides. No running water, no bathroom facility. Eugene, as you might say, is a little odd. There was a lot of tubs that had guns and ammunition. A large quantity of ammunition, more than what an enthusiast might keep. Get a load of this. He has grenades. The Marine Corps has grenades, but they're supposed to have them. They're illegal to possess. This is not a gun enthusiast. This is somebody that's dangerous. Yes? We're looking at the background of Eugene Bayless, one of the active participants in this event. And everything about him is disturbing. We discover him to be living in a root cellar in his mother's property with an arsenal fit for a warlord. Where did he get all this stuff? Not only is Eugene's cache of weapons disturbing, so are some of the illegal modifications he's made to them. He buys a semi-automatic submachine gun legally on the marketplace. He then disassembles that weapon and converts it into full automatic. Staring at Eugene's arsenal, Kenda sees the massacre at the Gemini Bar in a whole new light. I now believe that all my biker revenge scenarios are useless. We're dealing with a lone wolf gunman. Who knows what his motive is? Maybe he doesn't know either, but we are certainly going to find out. Eugene, I'm Lieutenant Kenda. This is Dr. Kingsbury. We need to read your rights. You have the right to remain silent. He has an unusual look on his face. His eyes are wide open. He's going back and forth between myself and another detective. We advise him of his rights. Do you understand these rights that I spoke to you? Yes, sir. Do you still want to talk to us? Absolutely. 
That biker caused me to do it. Excuse me? I just couldn't take it anymore. He pissed me off, and I wanted to confront him. So I went and grabbed my AK, and I went looking for him at that biker bar. Because you know, that, that's where they all hang out. Eugene claims he went to the Gemini only to scare the man, and insists he never meant to shoot anyone. What happened when you got to the bar? Anything special or anything? When I got inside the bar, the sons of silence guys, they jumped me. And we fought over my gun, and then the rifle went off. But honestly, I, I don't know what they hit anybody. Eugene says he was so taken aback by the incident that he immediately left the bar, but the sons of silence followed him out into the parking lot. From there, it was just like everybody was yelling and, and shooting at me. The bikers, they, they wanted me dead, and the police did too. Honestly, I've never heard a cop. When officers get on scene, he can't put the gun down. He can't tell the officers anything. He just couldn't speak. That's why he didn't respond prior to getting shot by us for him walking into the bar with a weapon. What he's saying doesn't add up. But Eugene, if everything you're saying is true, what I don't understand is why you even went there in the first place. I told you. It all started earlier that day, that dirtbag biker. I thought I thought I was gonna die. Wow, Eugene. So you were shot in the face twice in the same day. What are the odds? While the injuries on Eugene's face are consistent with a gunshot wound, Kenda believes the damage was solely inflicted during the shootout with Officer Rao. You were in the military, weren't you, Eugene? Yes, sir. I, I, I served in not. So you understand face wounds and how much they bleed? So if we were to search your vehicle right now, we'd find blood all over the place, right? Well, not really. I, I think he used a BB gun. So you didn't know this guy, just a random biker? Like I said, I went up to Gemini's because you know, that, that's where they all hang out. This isn't a statement, so we decided to end it. Right, thanks for your time. We'll be in touch. Sure. Okay. By the time Kenda and his men wrap up with Eugene Bayless, doctors have given him the green light to interview the crime's other survivors. Mr. Daniels? I'm Lieutenant Kenda. Alan Daniels says he's a mechanic, he's a motorcycle enthusiast, he's not a member of the Suns. He considers it to be a normal Saturday night at Gemini's. And we're having fun. There was nothing out of the ordinary that was happening. I'm having a birthday party for a friend of ours. Yeah. the front door with his girlfriend and they see a man approach with an AK-47. Get the hell out of here. Mr. Eugene, he's not trying to scare people. He's going to start shooting people as soon as he gets in that door.
trying to figure out what happened. The next to get hit is birthday boy Jerry Cooper. In the struggle, Klein is able to gain control of the AK-47 from Eugene. But according to several survivors, that's when Eugene drew a second weapon. Eugene, he's armed with his 9mm handgun. That's when BK is shot three times. The witnesses tell Kenda that after shooting Paul Klein, Eugene Bayless retrieved his AK-47, exited the building, and continued shooting, making one final, truly bizarre statement on his way out the door. Wow, that was an adventure. It was just fast, and I was like, how could this be happening? It was surreal. It wasn't real. This isn't happening. Is this, a, is this a joke for Gary's birthday? Is this not a really bad joke? The shooting continues. Bikers are running out of this place, trying to get behind parked cars and two parking lots. And Eugene comes out with this AK, trying to hit these people that are hiding. <laughs> Andrew Kiernan says he's shot in the parking lot by Eugene as he continues to blast away. According to the survivor's statements, it's then that Stephen Fairfax pulls Steve Fairfax arrives on his motorcycle. He's kind of wondering what's going on because there's obvious signs of confusion going everywhere. What the hell's going on? This guy over there with a machine gun shooting. A machine gun? Chris, what are you crazy? Yeah. He runs back there to try to talk some sense into the shooter. Hey, man. Welcome. 
PK was a hero. If he wouldn't have stepped in when he did, there'd be more people dead. We're all the bad guys. I appreciate you guys coming in. Thank you. With Jeff Martin's 380 revolver in hand, there's only one question left for Kenda to answer. We have a good understanding of what happened in this bar. We don't have a clear understanding as to why. In furthering our investigation on Eugene Bayless, we talked to his ex-wife who lives out of state. They've been divorced for over a year. Uh, do you know of any conflicts Eugene had with the Sons of Silence biker gang? No, not that I know of. I've never even heard him mention him. Uh, do you have any idea why he would open fire on that? Well, he's been an angry, vengeful person for as long as I've known him. She went on to report that he told her many times he felt trapped in his life, that he was married with children. He sees himself as a biker sees himself as a nomad. He could have lived a life of adventure instead of a life of drudgery. I appreciate the information. No problem. Thank you. Bye. He's in a downward emotional spiral. He's lost his wife. He's lost his job. He's living in a concrete bunker in his parents' backyard. He's stockpiling weapons. Why is he doing that? In this cloud of depression and paranoia? The human mind is a complicated piece of machinery. As for the guy on the motorcycle who supposedly shot him in the face, I doubt that even happened. Eugene was a wannabe biker. He wanted to have an adventure. And when he wasn't accepted by them, he took his revenge on the bikers. Eugene Bayless is formally charged with two counts of first-degree murder and 16 of attempted murder. At trial, Bayless maintains he was acting in self-defense. The jury acquits him of all murder charges. It was frustrating for the fact that, you know, we had a good case. I don't know if it's based on the fact that our victims were bikers and they were viewed negatively. We feel that he's still that he's guilty, but the courts have spoken and that's what we'll live with. However, Eugene is convicted of possession of an illegal firearm and is sentenced to three years in I'll never forget his face, I know that. I will never forget, forgive or forget what he did. I do not want to ever go through that again. That man put me through hell. No, justice was not served in this case. PK was a good man in the end, and, um, thanks for saving my life. You have two people who died and no one was found guilty of it. And there's no true resolution of that. Oh, PK! When you hear his name, some envision a warrior. After Saturday night, most will remember him as a hero. This thing that happened over in Gemini's was an unselfish act that he did. He saved the lives of a lot of people. Bikers are human beings. Even outlaw bikers are human beings. They're capable of moments of great courage. Stephen Fairfax, at the end of the day, was heroic in his efforts to save innocent lives. Irrespective of his history, irrespective of his involvement with the Sons of Silence, ultimately sacrifices his own life in defense of others. That is a remarkable thing. A rage killing ends a young life. We have nothing but questions. We not only have a who-done-it, we have a who is we need to find out who his friends are. <laughs> An unknown victim and no reliable witnesses. Hey, somebody has to listen to me! She's had a few drinks. Could she be wrong? <laughs>
somebody has to look out for the victim. If you kill, I will find you.
Thank you. So now we have a homicide. All we're certain of is he's dead. Still waiting for answers, Kenda turns his attention to store clerk Ricky Holden. How you doing? I'm Lieutenant Kenda. How you doing, sir? He's observant, he's cooperative, he's intelligent. Did you see the victim earlier? Oh, yeah. He says he notices a Hispanic male in his middle 20s on the payphone outside the building. I stopped paying attention to the guy because I had these three customers in line. It made me a little nervous. He came about that. Hey, man. Put it together. I'm going to take the smoke too, please. We have to smoke, please. The hard pack. Two black males, early 20s. And they're obviously friends, and they're laughing and pushing and shoving each other, basically having a good time. With them is a teenage girl. Wrap it up, dog. Pick it up and wrap it up, please. What happened next? They left. I took the dogs, kissed my line. Rick tells Kenda that just moments after the two men left the store, he heard a strange noise, followed by what sounded like a woman screaming.
he explains that she drove around to see if she could find him. And she saw the police at the convenience store, and she got very frightened. Tenda has a feeling he's just identified his victim. We asked her to describe Miguel to us on the phone. She provides us with a description of the clothing, body size, and appearance of our victim. Plus, Yvonne, as someone's been hurt here at this store, I just said hurt. And I want you to meet me at St. Francis Hospital Emergency Room in 15 minutes. Can you do that? Yeah, I, I can do that. F 15 minutes. I'm going to have her look at this body and tell me if it's Miguel Mendes. That's not a nice thing to do. Nothing about what I do is nice. But before Yvonne arrives at the hospital, Kenda and his men hope to solve the mystery of what killed her boyfriend Miguel. How you doing? We're investigating this murder. Do you have a cause of death yet? Multiple skull fractures. Are there any uh, bullet wounds or knife wounds or anything like that? Looks like he was beaten pretty badly, though. Broken ribs, braces all over. Thank you. I look at his head. It's obvious he's been struck and beaten with a blunt object. As I look closer, I see splinters of wood in his hair. The splinters remind Kenda of something he saw at the crime scene. I've seen a lot of murder weapons. I've never seen firewood used as one. It is a weapon of opportunity. Somebody is so enraged that beating on this person with feet and fists isn't enough. So he picks up something and uses it in the course of the assault. Not because it's firewood, but because it's there. The savage nature of the attack against Miguel gives Kenda a clue about the identity of his killer. Somebody was pretty upset at this person. You don't normally see this kind of activity among strangers. We need to find out who he was with who his friends are. But first, Kenda must break the news of Miguel's death to his girlfriend, Yvonne. I look at this body. I clean his face to make him look uh, slightly more presentable, and trust me, it was only slightly. This is Lieutenant Kenda. Yvonne? Yes. Person that was hurt earlier tonight, unfortunately, has passed away. And now that's who we have right here. I said, You're about to see something you've never seen. And I'm sorry I have to put you through this, but I'm afraid I'm. Bring it in, Laura. <laughs> we had been out earlier that evening, 
with Mr. Mendez. And of course, she identified as Hector and a friend of hers. And they had had several drinks together. Yeah, I think I'm ready to go home, okay? And after a while, her and her friend decided that they were going to leave. Her boyfriend decided that he would stay with Hector and have a couple of more drinks. He would be home later. So we are just beginning this case. Now we know who he was with. <laughs> On the night he died. Kendra wonders, did Hector and Miguel get into a drunken argument that escalated into murder? No, but man, I didn't told you too many times, bro. As Hector, you know where you find him. Yeah. Now, if we assume this is a rage killing, it is likely that an acquaintance of his is responsible. <laughs> you, Miguel. You too, man. What better choice than the man was last seen with him? Yeah, I'm walking. F*** Miguel. I'm walking. That's it. Hector, I am in your future. But you just don't know it yet. We're investigating the death of 25-year-old Miguel Mendez. He's been savagely beaten to death in front of his convenience store. Patrol is out looking for the suspect vehicle. When my interest has been piqued by another suspect, we find the last person he was seen alive with was a friend named Hector Rodriguez. We have determined where Hector lives, and we're about to confront him. How you doing? I'm Lieutenant Kendall from the Colorado Springs Police Department. I'm looking for a Hector Rodriguez. I understand he lives here. He's my son. Come here. He lets us in and he gets Hector. Hector! And Hector is 22 years old. What's going on? I need to talk to you about uh, Miguel Mendez. Do you know him? Hector says he worked with Miguel Mendez at a concrete company and they would carpool together because Hector had a car and Miguel never had a car. When was last time saw him? Last night. We went out for some beers after work. Hector says that he went out in the evening and then when Yvonne and her friend left, he and Miguel were still sitting in the bar. He stayed, had a couple more beers. Then after a while, Hector decided that was going to go over to another bar, the Yukon Tavern, to have some cocktails with another friend of his. Y'all have a safe time. Ah, thank you. It's what happened. Okay. Happy New Year. But y'all didn't want to go to the Yukon Tavern, so they parted company. But <laughs> <laughs> y'all walked away in one direction, and he walked away in the other. What time did you leave About 10? What time did you get home? 30. All right, we're here for a second. I'll talk to Dad. If Hector is telling the truth, it would place him back at home more than an hour before Miguel's murder. But Kent is not about to take Hector's statement on face value. Excuse me, sir. Can I ask you a few questions? Yeah. Were you here last night when your son got home? Yes. Do you remember what time that was? Uh, well, Johnny Carson was on. It was his monologue, so that'd be 11.45. It appears Hector Rodriguez is the truth. Is Miguel okay or is he in any kind of trouble? I'm afraid I have some bad news. Uh, Miguel was killed last night. So now Hector goes from being a possible person of interest to no one at all. And we are back to the beginning. Now. As the investigation is going on, information had been put out to officers giving a description of the possible suspect vehicle as well as a partial license plate number. 10 a.m. Officer Dave Fisher is out on routine patrol in southeast Colorado Springs when he hears an APB over his radio. They heard that a small white vehicle was seen leaving the scene and they gave a license plate number. This officer is aware we're looking for this light-colored car. He is aware that it contains at least one black male male and a white female. As if on cue, Officer Fisher spots a white car approaching from the opposite direction. One has to remember something about police officers. They are trained observers. They read people extremely well. 
he sees the black male, and he sees on his face what is referred to in the cop world as the look. He sees a fear factor in this guy's eyes. Suspicious. I made a U-turn and then observed the license plate number, and it was 114. Possibly spotted the suspect vehicle. And the red lights come on in that police car. And he stops. When an officer approaches a suspect vehicle with any type of violent crime, certainly their senses are heightened. You don't know the state of mind of the person or persons that are in the vehicle. Put your hands on the steering wheel. Put your hands on the steering wheel, man. Put your hands on the dash. Slowly reach down. Let me see some kind of identification. Look, I don't, I don't have any ID, officer. I don't either. We don't have any with us, really. Go ahead and step out of the car for me. Slowly. What's this Keep about? Keep your hands where I can see them. You need to tell me what this is about? Set on your jacket. At that time, I noticed wet spots on his shirt, and I asked him what that was on his shirt, and he said it was taco sauce, but it didn't look like taco sauce to me.
So we get our man into an interrogation room. He is Ben Colwood. He's 19 years old. Just tell me what happened last night, Ben. Who was at this party? Maybe I should find out. kind of cool. Ben Colwood <laughs> tells Kenda that he and his fiance Jenny had been at a pre New Year's beer bash and they left with Anthony to pick up some snacks. Hey, baby. I'm on the corner of Chelton Road. <laughs> He sees Anthony pick up a bundle of firewood from in front of the store, strike this guy with it in the head. He says he goes over there and he's going to break them up. And he says that's where he got the blood on him when he tried to separate them. I ran out to go stop Anthony. I was like, look, man, we gotta go and everything. That's how I got the blood on my jacket. Ben Colwood's story gels with the physical evidence. But Kenda isn't sure whether Ben is telling the truth or trying to pin the crime on his friend. Once again, I am innocent. It isn't me. It's him. He wants to paint himself as a peacemaker. And you know it's not true. decides to let Ben Colwood sweat it out in the interrogation room and turns his attention instead to Ben's fiance, Jenny. Have a seat. Ben didn't do anything. Okay, Ben, let's just back up a second. So, um, Ben's your fiance? Yes, he is. How old are you? 16. She says that she's a junior in high school. And you think, what are you doing running around with these guys? So what happened to the story? Anthony started beating on the guy with a piece of wood. He's like a crazy person. What's Ben doing? So Ben was trying to stop Anthony. Now she keeps insisting. Ben didn't do anything. But she's lying. She's protecting her intended. And it's pretty obvious that she is. And I, I said... But if you don't tell me the truth, we can charge you with accessory after the fact. And you will go to prison. Now you tell me what really happened? Whether or not you get involved in this up to your pretty little neck or whether you don't is going to depend on your answer to my question. Now, what did Ben do? I, I don't know why you don't believe me. Is the Mexican guy saying that Ben was beating on him too or something? I mean... What'd you say? Suddenly, it dawns on Kenda that Jenny doesn't understand the gravity of the situation. You do realize that this guy's dead. They killed him. And her eyes get huge. She looked at me and said, you're kidding they beat that man to death. I said, no, I don't kid about that, Jared. This is a murder. I know Anthony was fighting Miguel Benda. I know that Ben was probably participating in it as well. However, his fiance Jenny has been refusing to admit it. You do realize this guy's dead. They beat that man to death. That young man was DOA at San Francisco Hospital from the beating provided by your two companions. Now you understand why we're here discussing this. This is as serious as it gets. Tell me what you saw. Well, I guess Ben did beat the guy a little bit. <laughs> close enough for me. For charging purpose, he's a participant in a beating death. All right, you're free to go for now. I've released the girl from the custody of her parents. We're not charging her with an offense. Ben, I'm keeping. Sir, stand up, please. You're under arrest. Ben Colwood is placed under arrest for the murder of Miguel Mendez. I didn't murder anybody. But Kenda's other suspect, Anthony Scott, is still at large. Later that day, a call comes into the precinct.
precinct with a promising lead. Lieutenant Camden. The caller's name is Rose Garcia. She says she heard about the murder on the news, and on the night in question, she was at a house party. She's at the party, and everybody's drinking, and people are coming and going. But she specifically remembers two guys laughing. You had to make sure he was down.
vampires. He just said, you. On the street, you diss someone. You show them disrespect. Come here. I'm going to work on it. It's not to be tolerated by street people. That's important to them. It's not important to anybody else on the planet, but it's important to them. Anthony loses. You can almost predict assaults in which alcohol was involved. Because alcohol can really lead to violence in a very explosive way. He grabs the first thing he gets his hands on, which is a bundle of firewood. Thank you. I took normal dry cleaning to them. 
I never had clothing dry cleaned that were stained with human blood. You can't? Because they won't deal with it anyway. That's why you have cheap suits. You just toss them. Crap. No game for me. I got my laundry. Be clean. I just won't be a football fan. Pulling up to the crime scene, Kenda gets the new game plan for his Sunday afternoon. So what do we got? Deceased male, early 20s, no ID on him. Looks like multiple gunshots. Any witnesses? Not so far. There was a guy standing over him when patrol arrived, but it turned out to be nothing. They only find this guy walking his dog. He doesn't know anything about this. He was just a innocent bystander that happened to come across this unfortunate incident. I'm looking at our victim, who at this point is John Doe, is a male in his 20s. I can see six bullet wounds. And there are six misses. That's a minimum of 12 rounds. 12 shots. Somebody sure didn't like this guy. There is some evidence of linear shooting where someone is passing up and down the body while pulling the trigger. consistent with 357 caliber revolver which basically told us that we had at least two guns used at this scene but as detectives get a better look at the body it appears the bullets were just the finishing touch this victim also has a laceration on the top of his head that has the appearance of being struck with something that's heavy similar to a gun there are marks on his wrist and some lacerations indicating he recently was bound now that is very intriguing. Why would his hands have been tied and why are they no longer tied? So unfortunately, as is the custom in homicide, you have more questions than you have answers to. Our first effort is to try to identify him. So we're gonna take photographs of his face. Okay, buddy, let's find out who did this to you. And start knocking on doors that are close to this to see if anybody knows him. After canvassing dozens of apartments, you recognize this man? Police finally hit pay dirt. Oh my god. Yes, I'm to high school with this guy. The victim is identified as 23 year old George. And she says he comes from a good family. They're really nice people. We grew up a close knit family. George Jr. had a really big heart. We even take punishment for something he didn't do to take it away from my brother or my sister. Very caring and loving individual growing up. Lieutenant, we got ID. George Farabee. George Farabee. He gave me his address and his parents. Okay, let's go notify him. I'll recognize the face. I swear I've heard that name before. Crack. 
being a teenager around the time frame, 84, 85, when I came to Colorado Springs, I witnessed it take control of a lot of friends. So it changed him. He wasn't fun loving anymore. He wasn't joking anymore. It changed him drastically and it didn't take long. It got worse and worse and nothing we tried him. He was stealing money from his mother, stealing jewelry of hers from her bedroom, stealing anything he could get his hands on to convert it into money to turn it into drugs. What are you doing? I'm just looking at mom's pearls. Is this what it comes to? Everything's cool. No, it's the principle, son. Yeah, whatever. They had reached that point where they said, you know, look, I'm gonna have to move out of the house. They had no idea where he was staying, who he was staying with, and hadn't seen him. What do you mean by trouble? George Sr. informs Kenda of an incident that took place in his driveway a couple weeks earlier. Can I help you? George around? A couple of guys came by here, really rough-looking, street-type guys. He's not here. What are you expecting him back? I'm not sure. Can I tell him who's calling? That's all right. We'll find him. Well, I told him George wasn't here. And, of course, they got mad, but they did leave. Well, that makes a bell go off in my head. It gives me a direction. I return to my office. We start gathering information about George Ferby. Pull records, pull this, pull that. And then it hits me. A report filed five days earlier names George Farabee Jr. as a victim of another crime. George Farabee is the victim of a kidnapping by force witnessed by a number of people who see George stuffed into a car at gunpoint. Why is he kidnapped in the first place? What's he done? This is great promise to me. And this is where we're going to proceed. Investigating the death of George Ferriby, who has been found shot to death in a vacant field, and we discover he's a victim of a recent kidnapping. And now our focus is on the details of that case. Pouring over the case files, Kenda can clearly envision how the kidnapping went down. George Ferriby standing on a street in front of a business, and this car pulls up. Two guys get out. He obviously knows them. What's up? They talk for a few minutes. You just come with us. No, I'm cool, man. I'm not asking. One of them produces a gun. And they force him into a car and drive off. The witnesses, one of whom knew George from the neighborhood, reported the abduction to police, and a preliminary investigation was opened. Kidnapping in Colorado is very serious felony. It is basically one step down from homicide. But according to another witness, two hours after being kidnapped, George somehow managed to escape. Another witness, at a relatively short distance away from where this kidnapping took place, sees a person matching George's description running down the street with a gun in his hand. So now he's an escapee from a kidnapping. Which leads Kenda to another theory about the murder. What if the kidnapping find him again and they're so angry they just kill him that afternoon kenda learns that one of the suspects in the kidnapping has been at was vincent freeman and he was arrested based on a thorough description of the suspect vehicle by the witnesses and the discovery of that vehicle with him driving it vince freeman happened to have been in jail at the time the murder went down so he had a very clear alibi but it's still possible the second kidnapper was involved in the murder of George. If that's the case, Kenda needs to persuade Vincent Freeman to roll over on his accomplice. Without George Ferriby, who is conveniently dead, pursuing charges against these two individuals will be extremely difficult. So unfortunately, Vince is going to be released from jail in a matter of hours, but he doesn't know that, and I'm going to use that to my advantage. So you want to tell me what this whole kidnapping thing is about? Uh, it was nothing. I just went over there to talk to He says that George and two of his buddies came over to his apartment. 
Hitler shooting telephone in. <laughs> and they were talking and drinking and generally having a good time. This boy needs to slow down, man. He's turning into a dude. He's jumping. Hey, man. I gotta make some moves. And then they all left. And then he noticed that his wallet that had been left on the dresser had been moved. And lo and behold, they have stolen $280 from him. I don't know which one of them took it. Vincent denies abducting George and claims he only tracked him down to ask for his money back. Vincent is trying to minimize his part in all of this. I didn't do anything. Those witnesses are wrong. I was just talking to George, man. I was being real reasonable. Kenda knows that Vincent isn't being completely honest about the kidnapping or about why George was at his house in the first place. George doesn't go to Vince's house to say hello. He goes to Vince's house to buy dope. What does it have anything to do with drugs, Vincent? Is that why you're questioning George? I don't know nothing about that. Kenda decides to use Vincent's lie to get what he really came for, the name of Vincent's partner in crime. Now, he doesn't know that we're going to release him. He thinks he might be going down for first-degree kidnapping. So I said, tell me who this other guy was that helped you question him. And if he confirms what you say... We can probably clear this matter up and say Monday you'll be out of jail. What do you think? Monday. You can do that. I can try. His name's Dan Winters. He was with me. Thank you, Vincent. Have a game. Thank you very much. Take him to a fire station. Taking him to a fire station as opposed to the detective bureau, that's a little bit less intimidating. And the hopes are that he is more open to talking in terms of what he knows about this whole deal. Dan, this is Lieutenant Kenda. It's Joe. Uh, thanks for coming in. Let's all get right to it. We already spoke to your buddy Vince. And he told us about the money getting stolen, how you guys weren't really trying to kidnap George. And I said, we believe him, and we're probably going to let Vince out of jail, and he'd sure like to be out of jail, and you're kind of the key to that. Detectives are hoping Dan Winters will take the bait. What George did was wrong. Stealing's a crime. We know that Vincent was rightfully trying to get back something for George. We all know there wasn't cash. Tell us what happened. Just tell us the story we can believe. And Lieutenant, come let your buddy go. Yeah, well, it was a drug rip. George busted in with two of his friends. Had them at gunpoint. And they robbed him. And they took his whole stash. Dan Winter's explanation is the most logical reason yet as to how George ended up shot to death in a field. Arm robbery of drug dealers is exceptionally dangerous, and George discovered the reason why. They tend to fill you full of bullets for that, and they certainly did that to him. So now we've discovered that George is not only a victim of a kidnapping, but we've discovered something a lot more revealing, that he's involved in the armed robbery of drug dealers. Dan Winters claims George Farabee Jr. was part of a stick-up team that stole Vincent Freeman's cache of cocaine. What I want to know from Winters is, like, George the mastermind of this affair? Does everybody follow him? And George was the leader? George? Nah, he was just the door opener. The door opener? That sounds lovely. Um... It's not. If you are going to rob somebody and you've got ski masks on, nobody's going to open the door for you. George was a charismatic kind of person. He would be the one that would knock on the door and engage in some conversation. So, what's up, Vince? So you uh got two little things for me, man? All right, I'm sorry. Hey, yo, 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 yo. Don't leave me out here. How about we go back? Hook me up. Hook me up. Come on, man.
George had some compassion. He didn't look like he really wanted to see anybody hurt. So he relents. Hey, what are you doing? Lifts back the shotgun. Hey, man, hey, I'm not a witness. Hey, man, I'm not a witness. Hey, your face, man. We got the drugs. Let's go. Come on, let's go. Man. And they leave. Vince came back close. Listen, you know where George is. Vince wasn't concerned about the loss of the little bit of dope. All right, get back to me. He's concerned about almost getting murdered by some crazy son of a bitch in a mask. That's why they kidnapped George to find out who those dudes were. Dan says they tie him up with some wire, and that's the marks on his wrist. And Vince hits him a couple times, demanding to know the identity of the guys in masks. Who were they? George, look at me. Look at me. I know you were just doing this for the mix. So you tell me some names, and you can leave here with a little something. You gotta remember who George is. George isn't loyal to anything except narcotics. Okay, all right. So, bang, he tells him. Fred Williams. Jose Brooks. Now give me my fix, man, okay? You're gonna stay put for a minute? Don't let me find out you've been lying to me. I'll be back. So Vince goes off to act on this information, and Dan is left to guard George. What happens next? That didn't go so well. What do you mean? I fell asleep. You fell asleep? Yeah, man, I was tired. I fell asleep on the couch. something in return. A lot of times our information is of no value, but we have to see and hear what he has to say. Okay, I'll be right there. Thank you. Bye. He might have something magical to say. Mr. Smith, I was told you had some information for me. Yeah. But here's the deal. I know what happened to George. I heard them talking about it. And you want me to go to the parole board on your behalf. But no. I don't want anything. He was my friend. I thought, wow, here's a man who wants nothing in return and is convincing when he says that George was shot down like a dog and that wasn't right. Like the people that you want to get, 
are the two guys that were with him pulling stickups? Fred Williams, Tate Brooks. Why those guys? Aren't they all part of the same crew? Oh, they thought George was a rat. He said that once George had escaped, he went back to his crew, so to speak. And he told them what had just happened. Oh, what the hell wrong with you? Don't you see? This? This boy did? Trying to kidnap me. So, I escaped. Took old buddy's gun. Held him up at it. Just, all he did, he just asked me for y'all two names. They did a lot of them. They didn't just do pets. And they were very worried now that all these drug dealers were going to come looking for them and kill them. Look, all I know is that Fred and Taze killed my friend. You understand? It was them two guys. When he said that to me, all of these other potential suspects melted away. I believed him. You were investigating the death of George Ferebe, a man struggling with his addiction to drugs. From the time when I grew up with him, very kind and, and a generous person. Unfortunately, he was running with some, some bad people. Certain paths you take can be fatal. That's what happened with George. We have an informant who is a true friend of George Herbig, who identifies to us the names of the people responsible for his death. The informant, a low-level criminal named Matt Smith, claims he was confronted by Fred Williams, Taze Brooks, and a third man. Boy. He says that Fred and Taze and another guy named Wesley Fortune, who was also an in-and-out member of the stick-up crew, were suddenly really looking for George, and they were angry. They were on the hunt. So where your buddy George at? Where you at? I don't know, man. What y'all want with him anyways? George talks too much. You need to take care of that boy. And he drew his finger across his own throat like a knife. That message was clear. They need to kill him. Matt Smith believes the three men were worried that Vincent Freeman would let other drug dealers know that they were the ones behind the recent spate of drug reps. That's enough, man. Tell me. When you reveal identities to one, you reveal identities to all. They were fearful of all the drug dealers they had robbed getting together and seeking revenge. Came by. Well, I ask him, you're around these guys all the time. Does Fred Williams always carry? Does he have a gun? Oh, yeah, man. He's got a shoulder rig. He always carries a 357. Ew. Now, that's the right kind of gun. 357 bullets are recovered from our crime scene. And what other guns they have? Well, somehow Fred got a hold of it from somebody else. It is a typical tale with this gun. Guns pass through many hands very quickly on the street. That man. He says George gave the gun to a guy to cover his drug debt. That guy in turn gave it to somebody else. He in turn sold it to somebody else for 50 bucks. Back and forth and so on through all these different people yeah. and winds up in the worst possible pair of hands. Fred's. So George may have inadvertently provided the means of his own death. I appreciate you coming forward. Thank you. Acting on the information provided by Matt Smith, Kenda moves to bring Fred Williams, Taze Brooks, and Wesley Fortune in for questioning. We still need more evidence than we have, but we need a player in that group to talk. Now you can pick your winner out of that group, but Fred is considered the worst of the three. Fred Williams' criminal history was extensive. He appeared to have engaged in prior violent acts. He was wanted in multiple states. It seemed like he was the natural leader of the team. Fred is not a guy who's going to tell you nothing. So we're thinking about Wesley and Taze as maybe the people to go look for. We get good news. Hey, Lieutenant. Guess what? 
Townsend Brooks, we just gave him to a pop. Really? Yep, we can go see him right now. Let's go. He turns himself in. Now, why does he do that? He wants protection. Fine. He made the choice for us. So we bring in Townsend Brooks and we talk to him. Okay, Townsend. Let's get right into it. Tell us about you and George. George and I was just friends. Just did a little work together in the past. He confirms everything we've heard. So when you decide to murder George, I had nothing to do with it. That was our wisdom for it. Taze explains that they're having a card game in Wesley Fortune's apartment. Taze Brooks is there. Wesley Fortune is there. Fred Williams is there. At that? So f*** that George, man. This dude George more trouble than he is worth, man. Man, look, man, that's all you talk about. Look, nah, nah, for real. This dude can't keep his mouth shut. You gotta get got. Let's do it. No, 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 no. We can kill this hermit, bro. At first, I thought they were bluffing. Later, we went to see Matt Smith. We asked him about what George was, and that's how I knew they were serious about knocking him off. Kaze said that didn't interest him, and he went home. They stayed together and continued on the hunt. And last I saw him, they both had a gun. I, I knew they were serious about shooting. I ain't with it. What you mean you ain't with it? I mean, I'm going to the crib. Man, man, let's go handle this. The fact that only two types of ammunition were found at the scene lends credence to Taze's story. You clipped up? Lock and load. Where are we located? Good luck. They're probably gone now. At the beginning of this case, we were chasing ghosts. They're not ghosts anymore. They're Fred Williams and Wesley Fortune. To bring in Wesley and Fred, Kenda recruits some powerhouse help. We are aware that Fred Williams is a fugitive in two states. The U.S. Marshals are probably the best agency in the country for finding wanted persons. This is Lieutenant Kenda from the Colorado Springs Police Department. And because of the interstate activities of this individual, they're willing to pursue. But the next day, Kenda's fugitive problem is cut in half when Wesley Fortune turns himself in to law enforcement. He thinks maybe we're not as dangerous as drug dealers, so he surrenders and then lawyers up at the end of his incredible lies, and he's not going to tell us nothing. But we now have Fortune in custody. At the same time, Wesley Fortune is booked into county lockup. A pair of U.S. Marshals in Washington, D.C. are knocking on the door of Fred Williams' childhood home. Uh, sir, Fred Williams here, please. No, it's not. Do you mind if we step inside and ask you some questions? Sure. Interesting remark is made during the course of that conversation with the family. When's the last time you saw Fred? Two days. I don't care if I don't see him again. Wow. Pretty powerful coming from blood. And he's dangerous. And even his own family knows him. With the killer still on the loose, the frantic search for Fred finally picked off. When he is spotted, just moments after Marshall spoke with his family. The United States Marshals have arrested Fred Williams on 7th Street in D.C. He waves extradition and says, I ain't telling you nothing. If I talk at all, I'll do my talking and work through my lawyer. With neither Fred Williams nor Wesley Fortune talking, and no eyewitnesses tying them to George Farabee Jr.'s murder, Kenda knows the case isn't completely closed. I assure the family that we would find the people responsible for this crime and bring them to justice. It's always a major fight, but you have two choices. Engage in the fight or surrender, and I'm unwilling to surrender. responsible for killing George Farabee, Fred Williams, and Wesley Fortune. But you always worry, absent a confession, it is important to hold people accountable for taking human life. It's the safety of the community that has to be paramount. The justice system isn't just for a certain kind of person. Justice is for everybody. Ms. Kevin. Then, just days before his two suspects are set to be arraigned, Kenda receives new intel from someone serving time in county lockup alongside Wesley Fortune. 
it could be important, but then again, you're left with the fact that he is, in fact, a jailhouse informant. You generally don't get any doctors and lawyers who have knowledge of criminal activity. You get other criminals. It's okay. So it may be helpful, it may not. Who knows? So I was told you had something for me about uh, Wesley Fortune. Inmate Donald McCarthy tells Kenda that Wesley Fortune had recently approached him for advice. This informant has a reputation as the jailhouse lawyer. He's always reading law books and is considered to be some sort of legal expert, which he is not. But that's why Fortune went to him. So I'm hanging out in my cell one day, and Wesley starts talking about how he hopes the police can't prove that it's first-degree murder. Yo, oh, Don. Don. Hey, Don. Yeah. What's up? Hey, hey, I I've been thinking about pleading guilty to conspiracy. Well, I don't think they can prove much beyond that. Why would you do that if you don't think they can get you for murder? Listen, you're not getting it, I Me and Fred, we did it. We knocked them off. He tells him. We talked about it for days. We carried out the plan. It's first degree murder, just like the law says, man. I gotta plead to something. I ain't pleading to that. It might be your best bet. Otherwise, you might catch yourself wearing these oranges for a long time. When you get information from somebody who's in custody, one of the things you look at is, could they have read it in the paper? It did not appear that he had another source for the information that could have given him the level of detail that he had. Though Donald McCarthy's statement is second-hand information, Kenda can still piece together how the crime went down. I surmise Fred and Wesley hit the street. George isn't hard to find. George is trying to score drugs. He's around. We're just gonna kick it at the house tonight. George, man, come in. I got you on this one, man. Man, we found the best in the city, man. I swear to God, best in all Colorado. Come on. Come on. They found him without difficulty. They probably talked him into the car, which would have been easy. We're gonna go buy you some drugs just because we owe you. All right, all right. All right, it's good to be back with y'all boys, man. Kenda believes that once George was inside the car, Fred and Wesley made their real intentions clear. George, man, some drugs never really got to your head, man. What you talking about, man? You smiling? You think this is a game, man? You out here singing to the streets, man? You playing with people's lives? You renting us out? You telling names, man? No, 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 you already know that. George! Wait, George, what's the f code, man? What's the code? I know the code. What's the code, man? I know the code. I know I'm nah, in you didn't more than mess up, George. This was your last straw. I told you to leave them drugs alone, man. I told you. Did you know that white boy? He ain't saying nothing. Get the f***ing some snitches. They were part of a team, and it took George Blake zero seconds to rat him out. You a dead man, bruh. West, man, let me smoke this dude right here, man. They drive out there to that vacant field, and... nothing to people like that nothing at all in the end wesley fortune was the first one to go to trial he was convicted by a jury of conspiracy to commit first degree murder he was later sentenced by the judge to 28 years in prison fred williams worked out a deal and pled guilty to conspiracy to commit first degree murder in exchange for a 14 year sentence the weapons that were used were never found we didn't have any eyewitnesses that put anybody at the scene and so really all you had was information that would sustain charging them with conspiracy to commit the murder, the planning steps that they took. So at the end of the day, no one actually was charged with killing George Ferrandi. Very odd. Though they were glad to see the alleged killer serve time for their crime, 
George's friends and family feel his memory has been marred by the tawdry details of the case. I just would like people to know what he truly stood for. He was truly raised. He wasn't those things. He was a good guy. His life was just snuffed from him in an instant. So it's had a big impact on me, but I have fond memories of him. The last conversation I had with my brother, he said, I just want you to know I, I want you to know I love you. And I said, I love you too, George Jr. George was not a bad person. Addiction took his mind and took his soul and drove all of his behavior. He couldn't stop. So what's the answer? Don't start. Don't start. And he'll never be faced with the question of how do I stop? instruments because the body is natural. If you let bodies speak to you, they will. There's one thing that never changes. Murder. A life has been taken. Their stories are now my stories. I never know where a case is going to lead, but I'll never stop until it's solved. Somebody has to look out for the victim. If you kill... I will find you. It's Easter weekend, a holiday for most of Colorado Springs. But not for first responders Tim Deanst and Bill Runch. A 911 call has them rushing to the southeast part of town. They pull into the neighborhood and the lights are out, except for the one house that they're responding to. Good morning, Lieutenant. 
Josh. That's what we got. Pretty brutal stabbing. Male mid 30s. EMTs are transporting him over to St. Francis. The victim is identified as 36 year old Charles Walker. Charles was a veteran. He had fought for his country in Vietnam. He was trying to better his life, going to college, starting a new job. I mean, everything was on the right track for him. He's got multiple wounds chest, abdomen, groin, upper thigh. It is very often referred to as a blitz attack. Blitzkrieg, lightning war, a term brought to us by the Germans in World War II. Someone is frantically attacking with a knife. Any suspects? Yeah. Patrol's gonna be Hines, secured over there. She did dial 911, but she's absolutely covered in this blood. The majority of violent crime occurs between people who know each other. So I'm very suspicious of Miss Hines. I'll talk to her after I check out the scene. Right this way. This is where the medics found him. I look at the furniture, I look at the objects in the place, nothing's out of place. But Kenda's attention is immediately drawn to the blood-soaked couch against the far wall. The bloodstains I see look appropriate for someone who has already been wounded to lay down on this sofa and bleed. Have gone through the rest of the house? Any signs of blood? We checked. All the walls are clear of any spatter. So it wasn't stabbed in the house. Given as much blood as this person has lost, then there's got to be a blood trail. Where did the blood trail lead? We could find out without talking to anybody. Trusty flashlight. Light the place up. That's where the EMTs got him. So they've got more blood going that way. Look at the blood on the sidewalk. Followed across the grass because it's still fresh. It hasn't dried yet. So we're following that trail, and there is drainage bleeding in the grass and down a fence. So it's obvious to me that whoever did this did it right here. Looks like we had a footprint. There are sneaker prints in the blood in the dirt adjacent to where the stabbing probably occurred. Now, I do not know whether the shoes worn by the victim produced these, but it could also be that they have some other connection. The woman was in the house? Behind? Yeah, she said anything about a confrontation with Mr. Walker. I don't know how far patrol got in talking to her. So I'm looking at this evidence. This didn't happen in this house. But what if the disturbance happened in the house? What if the woman picks up a knife and announces she's going to cut him high, wide, and continuously? And this is where she catches up to him. And then, overcome by the moment, oh my God, what have I done? Helps him back home and then calls 911. I can see how this could work. At this point, the person that may have the best information of which interests me is this woman, Lee Hines. Science, you step out, please. When the police asked me what Charles had done that night, I told them I did not know. She has got a great deal of blood in her clothing and her person and her hands. Before you say anything, I know what you're thinking. Oh, really? The blood that's all over her is obviously from the victim. So if you have blood all over you, then you require a substantial explanation of why you look the way you do. I didn't attack them. Oh my god, what happened? She has an explanation about the blood. Is it reasonable? Yeah, it could be true. But it could also not be true. So, we'll see. Right, let's start from the beginning. 
Tell me what happened tonight and how your boyfriend came to the stand. I told them that Charles was not my boyfriend. He was a friend of mine that I was helping out. He was my roommate. Now that dramatically changes my perspective. If you're not involved with him, it is less likely that you would engage in violent crime. Charles was close with his family, but they did not live in Colorado Springs, so he didn't have their support. That's why I let him stay with me while I got on his feet. I came from Albuquerque, and he was in the military and in Vietnam. He was working really hard to put himself through school, and I just, I just can't believe that this is it for him. Lee comes across to me as very truthful, very emotional. She cares about him as a person. I've decided, at least for now, she's not part of this. At the moment, though, Lee Hines and the sole witness. So tell me what happened. This is all my fault. I just should have never told him about that guy. She says that to me, and I said, oh, really, what guy would that be? Vietnam veteran named Charles Walker who's in the hospital in critical condition and his roommate has just informed me she might know why and she might even know who. Tell me what happened Lee. It was around 2 a.m. There was this really loud party next door. Charles wasn't even home yet and I got up to get a glass of water and I looked out my window. She sees this guy. He's sitting there yelling at everybody. Shut the f up. <laughs> and then he... And then he what? She acted like she didn't want to tell me what else. I said, Miss Hines, I'm, I'm a policeman. I mean, you're not going to tell me anything that's going to embarrass me. What did he do? Then he... believed himself. <laughs> I'll be right there. Ugh. I was really mad. I have to go clean that up in the morning. Is this guy one of your neighbors? No, he was just there for the party, I think. Have you ever had any problems with your neighbors? Uh, people that threw the party? <laughs> no, it's a woman, and I think her boyfriend. I'd say hi, and how you doing, and chit-chat a little bit about what's going on. I never had any problem with them at all, and neither had Charles. So tell me what happened uh, after you saw this guy urinating on the side of the house. I just was getting ready to go back to bed, and... That's when Charles came home. Oh, hey. Are you still up? Yeah. Kind of sleep. Yeah, the neighbors in the guest room are pretty loud, huh? Yeah, they're rude, too. Really? Yeah, one of the guys came over and peed on the side of the house. What? You're kidding. Nope. And then he just went out the back door. Was he angry? No. I literally just thought that he just forgot something in his car. He didn't storming out of the house. He'll be right back. That's why I thought he went out to get something that he had left in the car. The party is suddenly over, but Charles doesn't come back. So she goes outside looking for him. There was absolutely nobody on the street. There was nobody next door. And so I went walking down to the left. Charles! Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god, what happened? And I saw Charles leaning on the fence. He put his arm around my shoulder and we started to walk back to the house. It was dark and I didn't realize he'd been stabbed. And I called 911. So this guy's like urinating on the side of the house. Um, you don't know him, but uh, did you describe him to Charles? I just said that he was wearing a white sweatshirt with the arms cut off, and he was just, just like a big guy. Now, it is reasonable to assume that Charles is going to identify who that is by appearance alone and confront it. So the odds are excellent, in my view, that Mr. White Sweatshirt is a guy with a blade. Hoping to attach a name to their new suspect, Kenda and his men head next door, where the house party had taken place. 
Every knock on the door, no response. Try the handle. One of the officers found a flashlight on the door. There's blood smear or something. I'm going in. The reason for entry is the exigent circumstance of could there be someone hurt in here? We want to make certain of that fact. No one is in here dying. Yeah. 
Her eyebrows went up. That surprised her. We found blood. A lot of it. You would know anything about that, would you? I don't know what to tell you. Now we're lying. Before, a little bit of truth here and there. Now we're flat lying. So where's your boyfriend? Where's John? Maybe he can tell us the truth. I don't know where he is, I swear. After we left, he said something about our friend Keith going to drop him off at a relative's house for Easter. Which relative? What's the name? I don't know. He didn't say. Why are you protecting John Martinez? Because you are. How about a guy at the party with the uh, white sweatshirt with the sleeves cut out? Who's he? I think you mean Pete. I don't know his last name. He lives with his parents. identifies himself on the phone as Pete Quintero. He said he was at a party the night before, and he knows that things got out of control, and he knows that maybe he's part of how it started. I was wondering if I could come in and... Excellent, Mr. Quintero. Come on down, Pete. You're the next contestant to this little scenario. Investigating the death of Charles Walker, page 36, and I am finally in contact with Pete Quintero, who to this point in this investigation has been my prime suspect. Mr. Quintero, thanks for coming in. He is anything but a hardened criminal. I heard about the guy getting stabbed, and I told my parents I was at that party, and they told me to contact you guys. Good for mom and dad. So he says he goes to this party, and they're there... Having a good time. Hey, I was in line for the bathroom, and I guess I was kind of drunk. <laughs> the line's terrible. I'm just, I'm just gonna go on the side of the house. I, I just decided to take a piss on the side of John and Debbie's house, but I just got turned around, and um, I ended up being in the neighbor's house instead. Pretty simple mistake. These houses are incredibly close to you. And Charles showed up a few minutes later. Excuse me, man. Can I talk to you for a second? Asking Pete, why did you do that? to my garage door, dude. Pete said he's not calling him names. He's not threatening him. He's actually pretty reasonable about it. I know you're drunk. That's, that's just not cool, dude. If he was your friend, he was very loyal to you. That night, he was just being Charles and defending the home front, I guess you could say. Honest, Mr. Kenda, I, I know I shouldn't have been peeing anywhere outside. But I was just really drunk in, and then I said I was sorry, and then I did it just, and then I really... Relax. It's okay. This is a murder. No one cares about the urination on the garage door, including me. But everybody cares a whole lot about the former Charles Walker, who is now a dead guy. Tell me what happened after you talked to uh, Charles Walker. I mean, he told me that it was okay, and just not to do it again. And then John comes out and they started getting into it a bit. You're Brandy pissed on my garage, okay? What are you talking about? You? Did they fight? No. Well, I mean, not, not that I know of. I was just really embarrassed, so I left after that. Pete, of course, could still be a suspect in this event, but his general demeanor doesn't lead me to think that he's the guy. All right, Pete, I'm going to let you go. But if you get home and realize there's something you haven't told me, it's in your best interest to come back and let me know. Yes, sir. If what Pete Quintero has said is true, Kenda's list of potential suspects has grown substantially longer. Pete says John went back to the house. 
and there were other people around. What if somebody else decided to take up John's cause and confront Charles as well? Kenda is more eager than ever to track down homeowner John Martinez. But so far, he hasn't been able to locate him. Lieutenant. Hey, Josh. We picked up a guy and he's being arrested for DUI. He's claiming he knows something about his stab Charles Walker. So talk to him. All right. I'm introduced to this guy, a Mr. DUI guy, who's still got a little juice in him, but he's coherent. Listen, I'm not telling you guys anything unless you can get these DUI charges dropped, okay? Well, that's not going to happen. But what I can tell you is that you'll be treated fairly. You get to say your peace both here and in court. Okay. He says, I was at this bar, and this guy walks in, and it next to me leans in and says hey you see that guy yeah what about him he says that's marco morello he stabbed the guy at that party the other night okay okay that's it i, I just gave you the name of your killer and that's his information stay put let's go around this marco morello's name so we got it you got it it's the kind of thing that informants come up with when they're in a jam. We still have to look into it, but I'm not confident that this is meaningful. But the next day, Kenda receives a surprising piece of information. Lieutenant, this Marco Morello guy, turns out he's got an assault record. But check this out. Apparently, he was involved in another stabbing two days after Charles Walker was killed. Oh, really? Well, maybe Marco is a little more interesting than we thought. This information that Marco Morello is is of Walker's death. Is this guy just like a serial stabber, or is the second stabbing somehow related to Charles' murder? There's definitely a possibility that Marco could be the killer. So we know about that. Check this. The incident took place right in front of the detectives' bureau. What? Are you kidding me? And I said, you know, if you're going to stab somebody. Wouldn't you pick a different place to do it than in front of the detective bureau? Hold case. Sorry, man, I don't have any money. Uh, you don't think I don't know what you've been telling everyone about me? Excuse me? I've heard everything. <laughs> Turns out this isn't a stabbing. This is an accusation of menacing with a weapon. If you threaten someone with a gun or a knife or a grenade or whatever, and nobody gets hurt, you've committed the crime of menacing. They arrest Marco, they take his knife away. It's a small pocket knife. Does he have another knife? I mean, knives are easily obtained. So he is an issue we have to look into. He was drunk when they arrested him, so they released him to one of the state places. Maybe he's still there. Good idea. Let's take a ride. With a few phone calls, detectives are able to track down their new person of interest, Marco Morello. Colorado decriminalized alcohol abuse years ago. So drunks found in the street are given to treatment centers. Marco? Marco, I'm listening to Kenda. Who needed to tell me everything you know about the stabbing of uh, Charles Walker? Charles Walker? Yeah. Marco comes across as a harmless, pathetic kind of guy. He implies that he has information that no one else but him has. I don't have any real personal knowledge of what happened, does it? What I read in his autopsy report. It's like, excuse me? Yeah. No one knows about the autopsy report. But as Kenda and Detective Hendricks listen to Marco Morello, they realize he may not be the most reliable source of information. He had all these different wounds from all these different knives. Right? You just knife after knife after knife. It's like a million knives all at once, you know? It's crazy. I'm going to excuse us for a second. Yeah, yeah. We walk out of the room and we speak to the detox concert. Does Marco have a history of mental illness? He's been diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic. I think once you find out that somebody 
you know, has a mental illness like this, you have to start questioning anything that they told you. How much of this is really real and how much of this is... There is no way this guy did anything to Charles Warren or anyone else for that matter. He is not the right guy. That is the end of Marco. With yet another lead evaporating, Kenda is increasingly anxious about finding the elusive John Martinez. According to his girlfriend, is staying with an unidentified relative. The guy that started all this is mysteriously absent from where he's supposed to be. He's not home, and he's not at work. I get very distressed about people who are not where they are supposed to be. Why are you fleeing the police? That's when Kenda comes up with an alternative plan for tracking down his suspect. This is Kenda. Now, can you do me a favor and locate a Keith Harris? He's the guy that drove Debbie, the homeowner, back in the morning after the party. James out! The guy that drove her by the house when she was observed by the police is the same guy that drove John to his relative's house hours after the stabbing. So now we need Keith Harris to shed some light on John's involvement in this crime or his lack of involvement. He now represents a key. Within the hour, Kenda is seated in Keith Harris's living room. Look, Debbie came over, and then I took her home. But as the two men talk, Kenda gets the sense he's being given the runaround. When she was over here, what'd she say? You know, I don't really know. She said she needed somewhere to hang for a bit, and I said, sure, come on over. Keith Harris has been in custody. He's been in prison. He knows not to ever be a witness. If you don't know, you can't testify. He didn't know nothing about nothing. How about John Martinez? What did he say when he was here? John wasn't here. You didn't see him at all that night? No, sir. You're lying to protect someone. Somehow or other, I can connect you to this. I'm going to. Is this something you want to go to prison for? It's the pressure. A veiled threat. The only thing that puts anybody forward is fear of their own trouble. Then they suddenly get an improved memory. Well, I guess he was over my house for a bit. Good. What else? I don't know how to say this. He had a... Uh... Keith, I'm losing my patience here. Do you want me to call your parole officer and let him know what we're talking about? All right, all right. When he came over, he had blood all over his sneakers. His clean shoes out there. Where is John and his bloody shoes? My experience tells me that John Jacob Martinez is the guy that stabbed Charles Walker to death. And he's got blood on his shoes. And I don't only want to find the shoes, I want to find the dude that's wearing them. Keith has located Keith Harris, who admits that John stayed at his house the night after the stabbing. When he came over, he had blood all over his sneakers. But that's not all. He had blood on his jacket, too, like, like on his sleeve. Sorry about this. Thanks for having us stay here in such a nervous. No problem. You know what the blood from? I got in a fight with my neighbor. Did you ask him about it? He said he cut him a few times. You're right, John. You certainly did. The next morning, before I took Debbie home, he asked me to take him to his grandfather's house. Well, I appreciate you being honest with me. No problem. I'll be in touch. Later that same day, Kenda and his men pay a visit to John Martinez's grandfather. But he insists John isn't there. He's obviously lying to protect him. Four days, we look for him. We check with the family, relatives, friends, everybody. We're always one or two steps behind him. Kenda is running out of patience. And finally, after all the searching, locates John's mother, Gloria. Martinez. Kenda's approach this time is to put the fear of God into her. Can 
You and I both want what's best for your son. You need to convince him to turn himself in. This isn't going away. And we leave it at that, and we wait. We don't have to wait. Stand up. Stand up. Hello, Mr. Kenda. John's here with me now. He's going to surrender peacefully. If he doesn't go anywhere, I'll be right there. Okay. Kenda and his men race back to the Martinez home. John looks like a little kid. He's frightened. Jim Martinez? I'm not talking. You call that guy? His mother got him an attorney, and he says upon advice of counsel, he's not going to make a stick. That's fine, John. can do that. He's wearing his sneakers. And I can see blood on his shoe. We book you to the jail. We have to swap out your clothes and your shoes for a jail jumpsuit. Sure, man. In his mind, he's already destroyed all the evidence. Well, actually, there is still a problem, John, that you didn't consider.
he'd start thinking, this guy has something to hide. To get to the truth, Lieutenant Joe Kenda must separate the con man from the con. A street person can see a victim from a mile away and catch a vengeful killer who's armed and extremely dangerous. That the shooter? Last chance, bud. Come out with your hands up. We're going to get to the bottom of this, no matter what. Whether you are an investigator involved in pursuing violent criminals, there is a risk factor that is always present. You're back to the subhuman animal that we all once were, attacking something that he sees as a threat. In reality, we're the most dangerous animal on this planet. There's one thing that never changes. Murder. A life has been taken. Their stories are now my stories. I never know where a case is going to lead, but I'll never stop until it's solved. Somebody has to look out for the victim. If you kill, I will find you. Somebody throws three bullets. 
looks at this guy and hits him twice. Found a weapon on the other side of the chair. It's a hunting knife. Deep quality that hunters carry to skin game with. But it's in a sheath and snapped in place. The knife could raise a number of questions as to whether it was used in defense by the victim or if there was another assailant. Nope. No blood. Any witnesses? Yeah, Johnny's roommate, Paul Chappelle, he was here during the shooting. He was outside in the hallway being questioned. And then her neighbor, Oscar Redman, he came down after the shooting. I think we're talking to roommate. Oscar Redman was an aftermath person. He doesn't really know what happened. He wasn't there when it happened. The guy that's more important to me is Mr. Chappelle. You talked to him first. Because he is in this apartment when this whole event occurs. So you're the roommate of Paul Chappelle? Yeah. How long have you known John? Not long. A couple of months. Johnny Crawford was from West Virginia. He had heard that, you know, maybe there work for him out here in Colorado Springs, so he was just trying to get his life started. He came across some hard times and was out of a job when this incident happened. So you were here when he got shot? I didn't see it. I was in the kitchen the whole time. Johnny was in the living room talking to these four guys. That surprised me a little bit. Four people, that's important to know. So I said, do you know those people? Actually, yeah, I knew one of them, Bud Carpenter. Johnny used to room with him at his old place. Chappelle says that there were three other men he'd never met before. Two men with blonde hair, and a third man who was very muscular and stood on the side. What were they talking about? I don't know, something about a guitar and an amp. CR amp? Where's our guitar? I don't know. What about the amp? Can we just well, at least get our amp now? Uh, I don't know about that. Just, you should probably go. And then the next thing I know, I swear to God, I think it's escalate. Dude, whoa. drops down to his knees and just kind of gets in a corner. But he hears them leave. Paul says nothing prepared him for the scene for the encounter in the living room. Oh, what the hell are you doing, Michael? Get out! And when I came out, the other guys had left. And Bud was giving Johnny CPR. You say to yourself, well, you know, he didn't do it because he was trying to help him. Well, not necessarily. It's not uncommon for people in a moment of anger to hurt someone and be instantly overcome by sorrow and try to help them, try to stop what they have just done. I ran upstairs to call 911, and when I got back, Bud was gone. You left? Yeah. Anytime somebody runs, you think that they're running because they have something to hide. So, you wonder, is that the shooter? So this guitar and amp thing, uh, is there anyone you can tell me about that? Actually, yeah. He says, well, I haven't seen the guitar for a couple days. It hasn't been here, but guys must have taken it. Kenda wonders, could Bud Carpenter have had some unfinished business with his old roommate? You still owe me three months, right? It's not just going to go away. That's 900 bucks. Bud, take the kid's amp. Damn right, I'm taking Where's your f***ing guitar? I'm taking that too. Man, I ain't giving you f***ing. Is that right? You work and find this, bud? Yeah, I'm pretty sure Johnny had some old nail lying around. Okay. Bud certainly doesn't want to be there when we get there. So I need to find it. I'd be ready for anything. to expect. So we certainly are on edge. He's in there. Bud, we know you're in there. Come out with your hands up. Is this the guy who shot Johnny Crawford three times? Well, we're about to find out. I have my hand on my gun when I hear that doorknob turn.
argument occurred in an apartment between an individual who resided there and some people who came into that apartment. At least one of those persons was armed with a gun and shots were fired during this argument. The individual who lived here was struck in the chest and the ankle by gunfire. We're investigating the shooting of Johnny Crawford following a visit by four mysterious men. We've identified one of those four as Bud Carpenter, and I have ordered him out of his house. Last chance, Bud. Come out with your hands up. Shoot, please don't shoot. Any weapons? No. Your hands are off. Go check. It's clean. Bud comes across as fearful of the police, fearful of everything, maybe, but he's not dangerous. But we just want to talk about what went on over at Johnny Crawford's house. Okay. Mike, we come in? Yeah, yes, sir. Come on. Now, he's calming because he knows we're not going to drag him off the porch or anything else. So, Bud, why'd you take off from Johnny's? I had to. If the guys shot Johnny, saw me talking to the cops, they might shoot me, too. Bud is a fearful kind of guy. He thinks everyone's his enemy. So that's a perfectly... We're just hanging out. And those three guys showed up. Bud says that Johnny lets him in. He goes and sits down. What happened after they showed up? We started just arguing about guitar and an amp. It's the our amp. Where's our guitar? I don't know. The conversation turned more tense and it became more heated. <laughs> you guys think you're such badasses. But he was kind of afraid. So he tried to divert his attention away from what was happening there and towards the TV. Well, no. I freak out kind of easy. Can't be around. It's okay, boy, take your time. It doesn't surprise me that this fellow is a Vietnam veteran. He has the demeanor of someone who does suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. They are fearful of conflict. People raise their voice. They want to leave the room. And they start yelling, yelling about the guitar and the amp. Whoa! And all of a sudden, he just goes quiet. What? You okay? You could see it in his face that he is in a total state of confusion, drifting back and forth between memory and event. A lot of vets who were in the Vietnam War era, they came home with a lot of mental scars that weren't treated because we didn't understand it at that time like we do now. And in his situation, it brought a whole flood back to him of what he had seen in the war.
It's kind of hard to get in touch with. But you know he's got an aunt down in Rocky Ford he's close with. He gives me the aunt's name. Bye, bye, bye. And her number in Rocky Ford. Thank you, and I'm very sorry for your loss. Thank you. But when Kenda calls the aunt, he makes an unexpected connection. Hello? I was hoping to speak to someone regarding Harvey Crawford. Who is this? This is Lieutenant Kenda from Colorado Springs Police Department. Yeah, this is Harvey. Harvey answers the phone. Harvey tells Kenda that he knows his brother was killed and has been expecting to hear from the police. Harvey, I need to speak to you. Uh, is there somewhere we can meet face to face? Yeah. Harvey agrees to meet us at a diner. He doesn't want us to come to his aunt's house. He doesn't want to get her involved in this. Understandable. Okay, I know where that is. I'll see you soon. Bye. The next morning, Kenda and Detective Arms anxiously await the arrival of Johnny Crawford's big brother with the hope he can lead them to the shooter. Harvey shows up. He's wearing a hoodie. It looks as if he's in some sort of disguise. Kind of. Yeah, Harvey. Sit down. He's a nervous wreck. So what do you need to tell us? It's kind of a complicated story, but I could probably tell you everything. Well, I like the word everything, so Harvey, you have the floor. Johnny moved out here from West Virginia, where we're originally from. And I told him I got this, this carpet laying business. I was making good money at the time. At first, Johnny did well working for Harvey. Same thing rolled out. But then business began to dry up. Johnny moved all the way out here because I told him his work. And it's like, now I came to pay him. It was getting more and more difficult for Harvey, not only to make money for himself, but to be able to pay Johnny. And of course, you know, as the big brother, you feel guilty about that. Last week, I met this guy at this bar. Says he wants to strike a deal or something. I'm I'm desperate, man. Go up there, sweet. Tough times, huh? Yeah, it's an understatement. Listen, maybe we can help each other out. I gotta do something. Let's go outside. Yes, sir. Thanks, sir. All right, so what are we looking at here? It's cocaine, man. Drugs, right? Yeah. Sure. Now it's obvious to me, Harvey has no idea what he's doing. So look, man, I'm willing to give it to you for a good deal. Right. I split town. I can't have the on me. He was willing to take a really low price for this cocaine if Harvey had the cash. Uh, we got a deal. Yep. Thirty minutes. I'll meet you back here. I just got to run to the bank. All right. We'll see you in a little bit. I saw this as a chance to try and provide for Johnny. I gave the dude everything I had. So now Harvey finds himself the proud owner of six grams of cocaine. His problem is now he has no idea what to do with it. Look, guys, I've never sold drugs before. I've I've never used cocaine before. I'm not into that. But luckily, a, a friend of mine, I mentioned my situation to. What was the guy's name? Oscar Redman. Well, there's a name we know. That's the downstairs neighbor, Oscar Redman. According to Harvey, a couple of days after he purchased the cocaine... Hey, Harvey. Go oh, home, man. Oscar introduced him to a pair of brothers. Got a couple of guys I'd like you to meet. Okay. This is Lance and Ted. Nice to meet you, man. We go way back. Nice to meet you, Ted. Okay. Yeah, we're looking to make a deal if you're interested, buddy. They said they had a guitar and amplifier and that they might be willing to trade that guitar and amplifier for some cocaine. All right, um, we'll meet you in the lobby in like 10 minutes. How's that? I'll right. take you up. Okay. I appreciate it. All right. Cool. See you guys inside. So you went through with it? Yeah. Look, I'm a musician. I'm not a drug dealer. I, I know how to sell a guitar. I, I could sell you an amp or something, but I was desperate. I just, I just needed the rent money from Johnny. Look, I'm telling you, Lance and Ted, they killed my brother. Harvey, that doesn't make sense. Your brother wasn't even part of the deal. Why would they want to kill him? Now Harvey is acting evasively, and he realizes that his story needs some backup, which he's unwilling or unable to provide. Look, it's just a feeling I have, I'm telling you. No, it isn't, Harvey. It's not a feeling. You know more than you're telling us. 
We're going to get to the bottom of this, and aside from finding you at that bottom, we're going to find everybody else as well. Hey, Crawford. We're now in contact with his brother, Harvey, who says he knows who did it. But we also believe that Harvey knows why it was done. And Harvey, so far, hasn't told us. Cut the crap, Harvey. Why would Lance and Ted have anything against Johnny? All right, look, I didn't tell you about everything with the guy at the bar and the drug deal. We're listening. I'm not sure that cocaine I bought was the real deal. And why is that? Harvey tells us that the person who sold him six grams of cocaine for $200. You know, this was really an unbelievably low price, and one would suspect that maybe it's, it's of questionable quality. A street person can see a victim from a mile away. This guy takes one look at Harvey and makes the correct assessment. 200 bucks it's yours. Certainly the price was the first thing that should have triggered some suspicion. Instead, Harvey thinks, hey, what a deal. We take a look at what you got. He had heard somewhere that if you put a little bit on your tongue and it gave you a numb sensation, then it would be good cocaine. All right, we got a deal. Harvey claims he didn't realize anything was amiss until a few days later, when Oscar Redman brought him a message from Lance and Ted. Hey, Harvey, listen. I just saw Ted and Lance, and they're pretty pissed. Oscar told them that Ted and Lance wanted to get the guitar and amp back, or someone's going to get shot. Harvey, listen, this is serious. <laughs> All right, look. Just forget about it. Good care was. I thought it was just a bunch of crap. A few days go by, I don't hear a word about it. I sold the guitar. Get the money. Sometimes stories, true stories, are bizarre because you assume a certain level of intelligence. Harvey has been mercifully spared of the ravages of intelligence. When threats of shooting comes forward, don't worry about it, the harmless. His reaction is to ignore this and it'll all somehow go away. Kenda wonders, did Lance and Ted come looking for Harvey? And when they couldn't find him, decide to take their vengeance out on Johnny instead? I just feel really bad. It's like I'm indirectly responsible for my brother's death. Well, you're wrong there, Harvey. You are directly responsible for your brother's death. Johnny has nothing to do with this. His only crime is that A, he is related to Harvey, and B, he is home when they arrive. Okay, Harvey. When do we find Lance and Ted? How about the third guy that was with him? Big muscular guy. Guys, I don't ask her something. That's all I know. Now, that makes sense to me because Redman introduces these brothers to Harvey in the first place. All right, we appreciate the information. Be in touch. So now it's time to talk to Oscar Redman again. The first time we encountered him, we thought he was nothing more than an uninvolved witness. Now we know he had everything to do with it. There are always going to be those people who will tell you as little as they think they can get away with. So it's pretty common for us to have to go back and talk to somebody two or three times before we might get the full story. When Kenda and Arms reconnect with Oscar at his apartment, they make their intentions crystal clear. Oh, hey, detectives. Oscar, we need to talk. And his face falls. I think there's a few things you need to tell us about who shot Johnny Crawford. He has the look of someone who realizes the cat is out of the bag. Well, I introduced Ted and Lance to Harvey. He says that I was just trying to be friendly. They both had a need for each other. We know there was a third guy with the brothers the night of that shooting. Big muscular fella. You know who that is? That was probably Ralph Spencer. Dude's huge. But it's obvious during this conversation that Oscar knows the brothers really well. He knows them so well, he even knows Ralph Spencer as the only big guy that they associate with. Lance and Ted, what are the last names? Nixon. Write down everything you know.
He knows that Lance and Ted are from the same town he's from in Nebraska. He knows where they live. He knows what kind of car they drive. He knows the car has Nebraska plates. I'm so sorry this happened. I knew they said they would shoot somebody. I just didn't believe it. We'll be in touch. We now know where Ted and Lance Nixon live. And that is where we are headed to. As Ken and his team close in on the trailer, it may be a matter of minutes before the case is wrapped up. Please open up! There is no response. Ready? The door is locked and we kick it in. Please, let me see your hands! Check every room of the trailer. We're clear. Clear. Nobody's there. Yeah. There's our amp. For this amplifier, and they leave it behind. Let's go. You're always hopeful you can turn this in a hurry, but now they're in the wind. So this has just become a lot more complicated. But turn it, we will. Within the hour. Oh, shit. Oh, we surrender. 
Ted and Lance Nixon walk into their local police department. Yeah, let me see it over here. The desk officer basically ran their names in the system, and they were placed under arrest. I, of course, want to interrogate them. So Skip Arms is sent to Nebraska. Officer, Detective Skip Arms from the Colorado Springs Police Department. I believe you have a Ted and Lance Nixon for me. Yeah, give me just a second. I'll get them for you. Sure. Here they are. Well, you can take us back to Colorado, but we ain't got nothing to say. Okay, let's go. We are certainly disappointed, and it, it is kind of frustrating, but you have to acknowledge that that is their right, you know, not to talk. But when Kendo picks them up at the Colorado Springs Airport, the brothers seem to have a change of heart. Can I ask you a question on my case? It's very hard for people to stay quiet. It is not uncommon for people who have been on a long plane trip to start to get comfortable and start to make statements. I mean, if, if we felt threatened, or that our lives were in danger, what if someone had a weapon? It could be considered self-defense, right? You guys invoked your right to remain silent. Given the circumstance, I cannot respond. This is a spontaneous statement made by the arrestee, and the law is referred to as raid justi, a Latin phrase that ultimately means spontaneous remark. That's what he's done. However, given that, if the suspect continues to talk and it's not at your direction, there's no obligation to tell them to be quiet. And so we will sit back and listen to anything they have to say, and that's perfectly legal. Can I just tell you my side of the story, and then you can tell me if it's self-defense? You're free to say whatever you want. We are now in a position where we have the Nixon brothers under arrest for first-degree murder. We did not get the interrogation I wanted. But what we did get is that their argument for their defense is self-defense. Lance Nixon continues to volunteer details of what he claims happened in Johnny's apartment. I mean, we were nice. You know, we weren't pushy. We just went over there to get our guitar and amp back. But his brother was there, and he was just crazy. He pulled a knife on us. So we didn't have a choice. Ted had to shoot. What he's saying makes no sense. After Johnny pulled the knife, and after he was shot, he put the knife back in the scabbard and, and locked it down with a snap cover. Are you going to say anything? I'm going to invoke my right to remain silent. Let's go. Kenda may not be getting the full story, but there's one important detail that's been straightened out. I wasn't sure who pulled the trigger, and Lance just handed me that in a silver platter. Ted had to shoot him because he had a knife. So Ted is the shooter, not Lance. Now, all Kenda needs is for a witness to confirm or deny if Lance and Ted are justified in claiming self-defense. Ralph Spencer goes into the apartment with the Nixon brothers, so that's why it was important to get his version of events. But Ralph Spencer isn't talking, so before Kenda can get him to open up, he needs some help from Johnny's roommate, Paul Chappelle. Okay, Paul. I know it was quick the night you saw those guys at the apartment, but uh, I still need you to look at the photos. We brought in Mr. Chappelle to look at a photo lineup that contained a picture of Ralph Spencer. That's him. In less than two seconds, he put his finger on it and said, that's him right there. You sure? I'm certain. He was just standing there, but that's him. Okay, good. All right, thanks for coming in. No problem. Once Paul was able to identify Ralph as being the third person there, we figure we have leverage now to really get him to talk as to what happened in the apartment. You've been identified by a witness as being in Johnny's apartment where he was killed. It's time to talk, Mr. Spencer. Ralph reacts like, oh, God, they know everything. Yeah, we kind of do, Ralph. I have no clue. Tell me what happened. As Ralph continues, he begins to paint a detailed picture of the events leading up to Johnny Crawford's death. Ted and 
the lads were telling me about this deal that went bad. And they were asking me for some help. They were going to go back to this apartment where the deal was made. How do you guys want? Where's Harvey? I don't know. I haven't seen him for a few days. Even if I didn't know, I wouldn't tell you. Ralph insists he just stood and watched while the Nixons argued. CRM. Where's our guitar? I don't know. Maybe Harvey has it. So where's Harvey? You guys deaf? I said I didn't know. Reading between the lines with Ralph's story. Johnny's being a little 19-year-old smartass. He doesn't realize how serious this is. This kid's talking smack, and it's making Ted and Lance even more crazy. We have any weapons out at this point? Just a small knife on the table. Ralph says that Lance sees the knife sitting in a sheath with it snapped over on the table next to the chair. And Lance picked it up and said, This tough guy here's got a knife. Okay, it's not even my knife, dude, all right? Calm down. You gonna tell us where Harvey is or not? <laughs> oh man, you think you're such fat asses. Ralph says he sees Ted reach in the back pocket of his jeans with his right hand and he pulls out a small pistol. Oh, 
吃了，不吃了，不吃了。不吃我这我我这我我我这美食肚子，我得留着晚上吃。我得留着晚上看看电影。我觉得咱不能吃这个，是不是？咱不来了，要不就吃外头的，不能把肚子浪费在这这这这上。王哥就这起码跳，哎，我跳舞还跳舞。我见蹦迪，你别啊，我见蹦迪我也不蹦。上回那蹦是祥云哥刷了，刷了那个六个超火，呃，四个超火，不是几个也忘了，反正是三四个大超火我才上去的。那玩的命了，那是。现在不不跳了，现在他妈是要命啊，要命啊！那会儿年轻还行。那会儿我才，那会儿我才三十九九岁，现在都四十了，不行。那会儿我三十多岁还能干这事儿，现在四十多了干不了这事儿了。这已经被废弃了，看来都没人用了。还真是一百万。是没多大，都是个人工岛，那就是个人工岛，就是个人工岛。啊，这上面这是游乐，是他呀，弄了一个人人工岛，然后呢，就拿一些人没玩的玩意儿建造下来了，不是什么自然风景区，这是一个人工岛，应该是啊，这是建了一个人工岛，没有什么这。小孩玩的，一小游乐场，主要就是这个，这个索道。我跟你说，他就这索道赚钱，这基本我都没人玩基本是没人玩儿。<笑>